Folks, we are at one of the most holy sites of all in Israel. This is called Garden's Tomb. It was discovered by Colonel Garden of the British Army. The situation here is exactly as the Bible described. First of all, you look up here, there's a large hill just to the other side. It's less than 100 meters away. On the face of that hill, there is a skull right on the cliff. And then right next to that hill of the skull, it's, the Bible says there was a garden in which there was a tomb cut out of solid rock. And if you look in back of me, you'll see a tomb cut out of solid rock. And the Bible said that it was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. It was a tomb that no one had ever been laid in. And I want you to look at the solid rock face there because that tomb was cut into the solid rock. Now, only those who had money could do that. Joseph of Arimathea was very rich. And that also is very important because Isaiah chapter 53 predicted that when Messiah would die for our sins, that he would be cut off and it says he would be buried in the tomb of a rich man. So all of these things indicate that they're exactly like what the Bible described. My, in my heart, I believe it is the place where he was raised from the dead. I get a special feeling every time I come here. In John chapter 19, verse 38, it says, And after these things, that, after, that is, after Jesus was crucified, it says, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, and he came therefore and took away his body. And it says, Nicodemus came also who had first come to Jesus by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds in weight. Myrrh was an aromatic fragrance, very fragrant, that had the consistency of shellac. It would dry to a very hard substance, but it was very, very fragrant and aromatic. Aloes was a crushed fragrance that was like a sachet. It was a power, powder. And what they would do is they would mix the myrrh, which was liquid, with the powder together. And it made a very, very powerful fragrance. Now, let's see what they did. A hundred pounds, by the way, is a lot of it, isn't it? All right, then it says in verse 40, And so they took the body of Jesus, and they bound it in linen wrappings with, with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Linen wrappings. All right, you know where they got their burial customs? From Egypt. The Egyptians would cover the head and everything, but not, not the Jews. But their burial custom was to take one to one and a half inch strips of fine linen and to wrap each limb separately like a mummy, coating it with myrrh and aloes. Now that's if you had the money. And so what they did is it says here they, they prepared Jesus' body with a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes, binding each limb, his arms separately, his, you know, like a mummy, wrapping his arms, wrapping his torso, his legs, and everything. Everything was bound like a mummy up to here. Now, they had a beautiful handkerchief that they would put over the face when they would bury them. So what happened is what we read here in John chapter 20. It says... Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. You know why he ran faster? John was a teenager. Peter was older. And so it says, looking in, 
he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. So John stooped down, looked in there. There was just enough light to show him that there were the linen wrappings that Jesus had been wrapped in, but he didn't go in. And then it says, Simon Peter therefore also came following him and entered the tomb, and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there. This is a different word than the other one that was used in verse uh, 6 or verse 5. Stooping down and looking at it, meaning he just casually glanced. But when Peter came, and it says he beheld the linen wrappings, this meant he looked at it, and he studied it carefully, but he was puzzled. All right, then it says, it says the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but was rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb entered then also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now I want to ask you, what did John see that caused him to believe in the resurrection before he even knew and understood the scriptures about the fact that he had to be raised from the dead. He went into that tomb. He looked at what Peter was looking at, but what Peter, the, the word used for John looking at it means to see and understand. He looked and he saw those linen wrappings, and it said he saw it and he believed in the resurrection, and he didn't even understand the scriptures yet, that he had to be raised from the dead. That takes pretty powerful evidence, doesn't it, folks? What did he see? Well, let me describe what he saw. When Jesus was wrapped in those one-inch strips of linen, tightly, mixed with myrrh, every, everything was coated with myrrh, after he laid in the tomb for 24 hours, that myrrh, which was like shellac, would have dried to a very hard case. And it would have sealed all of those wrappings very tightly around the body of Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he was put into another form, an eternal form, so that his body went right through the wrappings without disturbing them. So what did you have left? You had a cocoon that looked exactly like the body of Jesus, but there was no body in it. Now, when John looked at that, he realized there was no way to get Jesus' body out of those wrappings without cutting them, without disturbing them in any way, and leave them intact exactly in the form of the body of Jesus. So John believed there had to have been a supernatural act when the Jesus was raised from the dead. I'll tell you something, folks. The evidence is overwhelming if you're intellectually honest and you treat it fairly to say there's only one explanation for that empty tomb that was found here, and that is that Jesus rose from the dead exactly as he predicted that he would and that he proved that everything he said was true. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never die. Praise the Lord. I believe that. And therefore, I believe I'll never really die. Therefore, I can face death without fear because I know that the Savior lives in me. I know that the Holy Spirit lives in me. And I know that even though this body dies, yet in this body will I see God because God will raise it from the dead. And I know that the moment I breathe my last breath, the real me, the spirit in me, that has my personality and memory will go instantly to be face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ who died for my soul and saved it. What a Savior we have. And he, haven't, he hasn't left us to hide in a corner because he's left us enough evidence to prove that we haven't believed in a force, that we don't have to put our minds on the shelf to believe that Jesus is our Savior and that he has indeed paid for our sins. There's all the evidence necessary for anyone who will be fair with it to prove that we indeed have believed in the Lord of heaven and earth who stepped into time out of eternity and became a man, lived 33 years on this earth, voluntarily allowed himself to be judged for our sins in our place, 
and has offered us a free pardon if we will believe and accept it as a gift. And because he has conquered death, we never have to fear death again because we'll never really die.